it's good to see a couple familiar faces, um, but for most of us, I think we're perfect strangers, uh, which is really cool because uh, we're united in the fact that we're brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, and so it is a privilege to bring God's word to you uh, this morning. The call to worship comes from Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food. Well, as we come before our God who satisfies, we do so recognizing and confessing where all our strength and all our help comes from. So, congregation, where does your help come? God greets you into worship with these words, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it's the rich fruit of God's word that we feast on this morning, so let's uh, do so by singing again from God's word from the book of Psalms, uh, from Psalm 100. We're going to be singing the alternate uh, one in the proposed song book, Psalm 100. In John chapter 8, Jesus was teaching uh, some Jews um, about who he was, that he was the Messiah. And he said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. And he said these beautiful words, If the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. One of the reasons we read the Ten Commandments uh, in this morning service is because Jesus has set us free. Just like God set the people of Israel free and then gave them the commandments to live in that freedom, Christ Jesus sets us free from the slavery to sin. That's the beautiful news of the gospel, that we're not slaves anymore, but we live free. And part of that freedom is living in accordance to how Jesus now calls us to live as free people So as we read through uh, the Ten Commandments uh, in Exodus 20, think about that. Think about how Christ has set you free and now outlines how you are to live in that freedom. So Exodus chapter 20, starting at verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the, ge- on the children, on the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me 
and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The six days you are to labor and do all your work, but the seventh is the Sabbath day to the Lord your God. Ani shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the freedom that Christ calls us uh, to live in. And this is... um, a good law, it's God's law. And there's a psalm in the book of Psalms called uh, Psalm 119, and it's a whole psalm about how God's word is beautiful and God's law is beautiful and how it gives us life and it gives us direction. So why don't we uh, sing that together, Psalm 119, in reflection of the law, verses 1, 5, and 6. Let's come before our God in prayer uh, and ask a blessing over the service. Let's pray. Our awesome and holy Father, we thank you for this time together as a congregation, as visitors, as uh, guests here, young and old, coming before you in worship. We thank you for this time where we can open up your word and, and hear from you, where we can read your law and we can see 
uh, what kind of God you are. That you are a God who gives us uh, your law to help us flourish, to set us free from sin. You don't want to see us in bondage. You don't want to see us uh, so tired and so restless and so um, just struggling through this life. But you want to set us free. You did that by sending us Jesus Christ who told us that if we were ever tired, if we were ever struggling, if we are ever uh, going through difficult things in this life, that we can come to him. He's the one who gives us rest. And so we thank you for this. We thank you for Jesus. We pray that you would help us as we reflect on your law to root out sin in our hearts. If there's things that we brought in here with us this morning that are uh, hindering our worship, we pray that you would work in our hearts now to repent of those things and to confess them to you so that we are... Uh, before you blameless, washed in the blood of Jesus. We pray that you would uh, give us a blessing over this service as well, that you would open up our hearts, our minds, that we would see who you are, that you are a God who is so powerful and so mighty, who knows each one of our situations, you know exactly what we're going through, you know what has happened to us in the last year, the last 10 years, the last 50 years, the last 90 years, and you're a God who sees us and knows us. So I pray you would open up our our minds, our hearts, give us your Holy Spirit, and help me, Father, to speak clearly, understandably, and may you receive all the praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking uh, at uh, an Old Testament psalm this morning, Psalm 63, but before we do that, we're going to look at a New Testament passage in the book of Romans. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to pull it out and turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're not going to read the whole thing. We're just going to read a few verses at the end. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 31. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse uh, 31. This is probably one of the most beautiful passages in the whole Bible. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I just did. So, Romans 8, verse 31. This is Paul speaking about uh, the future glory of, of, of Jesus and his everlasting love for us. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Before we turn to Psalm 63, let's sing another psalm that has similar themes to Psalm 63. It's Psalm 42 speaking about how we thirst after God. Uh, let's sing Psalm 42, verses 1 and 5, and you re can remain seated for the song.
Well, open up your Bibles again and, and turn with me to Psalm 63. If you open your Bible right in the middle, you should get pretty close. Uh, Psalm 63. Psalm 63 is a psalm uh, written by David. The heading on top of the psalm you'll see is a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. A psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. So read through the whole psalm together. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exalt, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. This is the word of the Lord. If you have a Bible and you're not just looking at the screen, uh, kudos to you, thank you. And also, you can keep it open. And, and I'm going to be working through the psalm pretty well verse by verse. So that'll be helpful for you if you keep that open in front of you. I'm sure the sound people in the back will put the verses up. I'll try to call it out. So, dear congregation, uh, this morning we're looking at a psalm written by King David uh, when he was in a dry, hot, barren wilderness. Uh, the main creatures that inhabit the wilderness of Judah are uh, these really cute desert foxes, um, scorpions, uh, snakes, and really scary looking spiders. And maybe some of you kids are into that stuff and you're braver than me. Um, but for most of us, this is not a place that we want a vacation to. The, the wilderness of Judah was a place where water was hard to find and food nearly impossible. The setting of the psalm is possibly when, when David was uh, running from his uh, father-in-law Saul, but I think it's more likely um, when he was running away from his own son Absalom. So in this wilderness that he's in, he's writing this psalm, and, and, and while he's writing it, he is thirsty, he is hungry, he is tired, he is vulnerable, and likely betrayed. His life, you could say, is, is, is literally falling apart around him. And it's in this intensely difficult situation that he wrote Psalm 63. And as I studied this passage, I had this profound jealousy for David as I, as I read through it. Because what David wrote here is, is not what you would expect. It's not what you'd expect. He looked around at everything that was going on around him. And instead of blaming God, instead of pulling back away from God, he raises up his hands and he starts to praise God. Some of you may know this, I, I used to work at um, Campfire Bible Camp, and when we worked there, we had this cheer that we would do. We would gather up in a circle uh, after we prayed, we put our fists in the middle, and we would say, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. And there were times when we said that cheer with smiles on our faces, and there were times that we said it with, with tears in our eyes because the things that were going on were really difficult. When things were happening, it didn't really make sense. And we asked the question, you know, how, how is God good right now? We don't understand it. We don't see God's good in this situation. And when I, when I studied Psalm 63, I found that, that, that David had this insatiable thirst for God. He saw the goodness of God in his situation, and I wanted that. 
I wanted that insatiable thirst and hunger for God that I saw in Psalm 63. And I hope this morning as we work through this psalm that you will want that too, that you will experience that too. Because here's, here's the big question that we need to ask about this psalm. How could David write it when he was in that situation? How could he write Psalm 63 when everything in his life is falling apart? And the answer, we're going to see the answer already, is because he rooted himself in something. He rooted himself in the love of God. He rooted himself on that firm foundation that God's love is better than life. That God's love is better than life itself. And this psalm is kind of like a survival guide for us to learn from David how to handle our own wilderness wanderings in this life. And so maybe this morning you're feeling very far away from God. Or, or you're going through a very difficult thing, a difficult season. You're, you're, you're in your own spiritual wilderness. Or maybe you know someone who is. Or, or you're right there in the thick of a really difficult situation. Or you're just coming out of one. Whatever the case is. This psalm, it it helps us as we walk through wilderness wanderings in this life. And so the theme is pretty simple. It's just God's love is better than life. And we're going to circle on that uh, in a bunch of different ways. Walking through the psalm, we're going to first look at how David teaches us to seek God earnestly. He teaches us to praise him endlessly. And then finally, to trust him confidently. I don't know about you, but that last one is the hardest, I think. Trust him confidently in the wilderness. So we'll get there at the end. Let's start with point number one. Seek God earnestly. So verse one opens up, and David uh, starts by addressing God. I'm going to read that again. Psalm, uh, verse one. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I want us to first notice right away what, what David's first lesson is for us. When everything is falling apart, who do you turn to? Who do you turn to? David teaches us here that the first person you should turn to is God. He says, you, God, are my God. He, he's talking experientially here. He's talking relationally here. David was saying, you're the one that I pray to. You're the one that I, I, I praise. You're the one that I worship. You're my God through thick and through thin. And in this dry and weary land where there's no water, you're the one that I seek. That's the first lesson. And then he follows it up right away with the second lesson, is how. How do we turn to God when we're in our wilderness? And David here, he's not casually seeking God. Like if you go to you know, one of the thrift stores and you look through the clothes section and you're like, eh, I'm just casually looking. And if I find something, maybe I'll buy that, maybe not. He's not, he's not casually seeking God. He's earnestly seeking God. You know, some of you kids, I wonder if you've ever had this where um, there's a toy or, or something like that and, you, and you're trying to find it, this thing that you're trying to find. And so you go into your room and, and you rip the whole thing apart and, and you can't find this toy. So then you're like, okay. You go to your brother or sister and you're like, hey, have you, have you seen this, this toy? I don't know, this thing. And they're like, no, I haven't seen it. But you don't believe them so you go into their room and you pull it apart too. It's not there. So you keep looking and, and you go into the living room, you pull all the couch cushions off and you're like, is it there? It's not there. You go into the kitchen and you go to the Tupperware cupboard because that's where everything ends up anyways and you shovel it all on the floor and your mom's like, get out of here. And it's not there and you keep looking, you keep looking, you keep looking until you finally find what you're looking for. You're, you're so earnest and, and trying to find it. That's what that word means, earnest. You're looking and you're looking and you don't give up until you find what you're looking for. See, that's, that's the kind of searching that David is talking about here when he's expressing that he's searching after God. He's earnestly seeking after God. And I don't know about you, but, but that's often the opposite of, of what I do. That's often the opposite of what we, what we normally do. When we feel far away from God, when we feel confused with God, what we often do is we just we pull back. We, we start to drift. We stop praying. We stop reading his word. We stop searching after him. And we know that that's not, that's not the right thing to do. We know that from different experiences in our life, how this works out. Like, like for instance, if you're in a marriage or, or you have a friendship and, you, and you're feeling far away from that, that friend or, or your spouse, wh- what do you do? Right? What's the solution to that? Is the solution to pull back farther and farther? 
Well, what, what you should do is, is, is pursue them. Call them. Say, hey, we need to spend more time together. We need to connect. We need to uh, earnestly <laughs> spend time reconnecting and, and finding uh, back our friendship, back our marriage. And when we do that, we know that it's so worth it. It's hard. It's hard to do that. But it's, it's so important and so beautiful when you see that, that reconnecting happening. And you know true uh, as, as well that, that the longer you wait, the harder it is to come back. The harder it is to, to reconnect. And so David says, do this earnestly. Do it intentionally. See, while, while David was, was writing this, he was literally in a desert, literally in a, in a wilderness. Maybe some of you can picture that if you've been to a desert before. It's pretty barren. It's pretty empty. And David's expressing uh, that he's, he's thirsting. He's thirsting after water. He's, he's earnestly looking for some water so that he doesn't die. He's in a life or death situation. You know, and maybe for some of us uh, living in Ontario, we don't really get this. Maybe if you come from a different country where, where water is more scarce, you might understand David's plight here. But, but for us, I mean, we just turn on the tap and whoosh, endless water, it seems like. We don't understand uh, that feeling of, of cracked and swollen lips, the, our tongue stuck to the roof of our mouths, the dizziness, the hallucinations that come with this level of thirst that David was literally experiencing in the wilderness. And he took that reality that he was experiencing there. And he made this parallel to how his soul was doing. In verse 1, he wrote, My soul thirsts for you. It's parched. Maybe that's a thirst you can relate to. When, you're, when your soul feels so parched, and this, this can manifest in, in many different ways, for many different reasons, in David's case here, he was, he was thirsting because he longed to worship God in the sanctuary. That's what he says in verse 2. And the sanctuary, that's, that's a place back in Jerusalem, back where he uh, was king, but he's not there anymore. He got driven out. The, the sanctuary is a place where he, he encountered God's power and his majesty, often in very tangible ways. But he's not there. He's, not, he's on the run. He's in the wilderness, and he can't be there. And so he's saying that I'm thirsting after that. I'm thirsting after that experience. And you know, in, in, in some ways, it's not, it's not a perfect parallel, but, but in some ways, I think this is, this is how our heart posture should be when we come into to church, right? Like, I, I wanted you to come in here this morning, through those doors, expecting to hear the gospel, expecting to drink deeply of, of Jesus and his love for you, and, and being refreshed and, and, and ready to go back out into your week, whatever you're facing. I want you to feel renewed and excited when you drink deeply of Jesus. And this is what he said all through his ministry, right? If you read through the Gospel of John, a couple of times he says, if anyone is thirsty, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Come drink deeply of my love. So then the question we need to, to ask ourselves maybe is this. What if you're, what if you're sitting here this morning uh, and you're not thirsty? I don't know you all. I can imagine uh, that there's all different reasons why you're here this morning. Maybe you're here because your partner believes in this religious stuff, but you're not really sure what it's all about. Or maybe your parents dragged you here and you, you didn't want to come, but you have no choice. Or maybe this is just what you do, right? It's Sunday, got to go to church. Don't put much thought into it. But you got to ask the question, why, why are you here? Why are you here? Eric Alexander, he's this uh, Welsh pastor. He tells the story of when he was a, a boy, uh, when he was living in South Wales, and there was this spiritual revival going on in his hometown. And people were flocking to the church uh, from all over just to taste and see uh, and drink deeply of, of the gospel and of Jesus and his love for them. And one, one Sunday, uh, there was a guest uh, preacher who came in, and he uh, hadn't really been... Uh, knowing what was going on in, in, in the revival. He didn't really know. Uh, so he goes up to the front of the pulpit like this, and he drops down his manuscript, drops his glasses down like this, I'm thinking, and then he just starts to read this philosophical discourse about attaining the higher life or something like that. And he's droning on and on and on, and there's uh, a man that was sitting in the front pew, 
who had been remarkably converted during the revival, and he puts his hands down on the pew in front of him, puts his hands in his face, and, and then just at one point cuts the pastor right off, and he says, give us God, sir. Give us God. Because when the Spirit is at work, then he produces this, this thirst in you and this longing in your whole being and so if you are not thirsty, then, then pray that the Spirit would make your thirst for God insatiable. Pray right now. Make me thirsty for the gospel. See, that, that, that soul thirst for God will, will burn inside you when you come face to face with the steadfast love of God. And the steadfast love of God is, is his, his never stopping love. It's his his, his never giving up love, his unbreaking, his always and forever love. And that's the love that David says, I'm going to root myself in. I'm going to stand on that firm foundation of God's love. And that's what we see in verse 3. And this is where he answers the question. How could he write what he wrote? How, how during the intensity and the desperate nature of the situation, he was so fixated on God. He says it's because of this, because of this firm foundation that he stood on. Where I, he's like, I'm standing here and I'm not going anywhere. He said, God's love is better than life. God's love is better. Try to, try to wrap your head around that for a minute. God's love is better than life. To have God's love for you, to have God look at you and say, I love you. Everything that you've done, everything that I know about you, I love you. David's like, that, that is better than anything else. That is better than even having breath in my lungs. And this, this is the foundational truth that David stood on when everything in his life was falling apart. This is the foundational truth that all of us can stand on and we can put our faith in Jesus even when in life it doesn't feel like it. You know, even when you're in your own wilderness wanderings, even when you feel far away from God, you know, even when your, your plans fail, even when your marriage it crumbles or the person that you love doesn't recover, even when the medications that you're taking aren't working, even when you can't find a job or you can't pay the rent, even when things in school are so tough and then you just come home and they're even tougher, even when your relationships are, are painfully splintered to pieces, and even when your little baby's never born, and even when you watch loved ones go through hell and you're like, what are you doing, God? I don't understand. The beautiful truth is that God's love for us is it's better than life. See, that's what's so amazing about covenantal love. It doesn't stop and it doesn't depend on how you're doing this morning. It doesn't depend on what you've gone through and it doesn't depend on what you're going to go through. It doesn't stop. See, God's love for you, it's, it's not threatened by how you feel this morning. I think, think back to Romans 8. What did Paul say there? What can separate us from the love of God? What can separate you from his love? Can feeling far away from God separate you from his love? No. Can whatever trial you're going through, or the people around you are going through, the people that you love are going through, can that separate you from God's love? No. No, nothing can. See, God's love, it enters into our wilderness, and, and God, he doesn't pull back in disgust, or dismissal when, when we, with our sins and our troubles, cry out to him. No, what he tells us is he enters into our wilderness. And in our wilderness, he says, I love you. So that's, that's one perspective on this psalm. We also need to look at another perspective. Um, not a wrong perspective, just a different one. So maybe you're sitting here this morning. Uh, and you have been blessed by God in, in many different ways. And you could say, you know what, life is good. Life is great, in fact. And you would give your head a nod to that, that phrase, you know, God's love, better than life. Amen. 
But here's, here's the challenge for you that you need to just spend a little bit of time reflecting on this morning. Is God's love better than all those good blessings that you have in your life? Even the good ones. Is God's love better? Right? Just, just take a minute and strip everything back. Strip, strip your whole life back, all the good things, all the good blessings, and what are you left with? It's good to do once in a while. Just reflect. If everything is taken away, what are you left with? And what the psalm tells us is what you're left with is God's love for you. And that's not going anywhere. And it's because of that foundational truth that that David is standing on in this terrible situation uh, that he's able to say, my lips will praise you. It's because of this foundational truth that no matter what is going on, what you're going through, good or bad, you're able to say, my lips will praise you. Because endless praise, that's the natural response to God's love. That's the second point. I'll get through the next two a bit quicker. So look at, look at your Bibles again. If you look through verses 2 to, to 5 or so, 2 to 6, there's this progression of, of, of thought that's going through. All right, follow, follow the logic. He says, because I've gazed on your glory, because I've gazed on your power, because your love is better than life, then therefore I will praise you. Therefore, I will bless you as long as I live. Therefore, in your name, I will lift up my hands. And, and that, that last phrase, therefore, I'll lift up my hands, that's, that's an interesting phrase in verse 4 of praise and, and, and prayer. Uh, the Hebrew, it alludes to this posture where your palms are up in the air uh, in a position of, of vulnerability, a position of, of humility, a position of surrender. And notice, notice that key word that just keeps coming up again, the key verb, he will praise, he will bless, he will lift up his hands. And this, this might seem like the hardest part of this psalm for you this morning. Whenever you're going through that time of wilderness, how can you praise, how can you bless, how can you lift up your hands and praise to God? And if that's hard for you this morning, then, then I would suggest that you, you, you think about and you pray this very simple and maybe very short prayer where you say, Father, Today I offer up to you my praise. Even though I don't know what you're doing and I don't understand, I offer my praise to you because I know that you love me. I know that you hear my prayer. I know that you sent your son Jesus to die for me and I know, I know that you will deliver me from this, whether in this life or in the next. David takes, takes that. I will do this, I will bless, I will lift up my hands. And he continues on, and he starts to just testify about the steadfast love of God that satisfies him. Look at verse 5 with me. David says, My soul will be fat, satisfied as with fat <coughs> and rich food. And here he's just, he's just gorging himself on the steadfast love of God. The imagery here I get is, is of, of the triple thick chocolate cheesecake or the thickest cut of bacon or something like that. Definitely not what your doctor would prescribe, but, but in David's context, this meant that the best of the best of the best foods. You know, ha- have you ever had it where you, where you go to someone's house, um, someone that, you know, makes amazing food, and, and you go there and you come hungry, and, um, and you sit down and there's this beautifully laid out table, and, and then they start bringing out the food, and every single bite is just so good. And you eat and you eat, and, and it's just so satisfying. And, and so finally the meal's over, and you, you lean back in your chair, and uh, you're, just, you're just so satisfied. Everything was so delicious. And then you see the host um, open up the oven, and there's that apple crumble crisp stuff. And they cut it up nice and put it on a plate. And they got ice cream, and it starts to melt all over there. I better stop. And you're like, yeah, I can make room for that as well. I can make room for that. And you just, you just get so satisfied by fat and rich food. I wonder if you've ever feasted on God's grace like that. Where your soul hunger drives you to just grab your Bible and read and read and read more about the God who saved you. Where, where all you want to do is sing and sing and sing. And you're like, Josie, don't listen to Kevin. Just play another song, play another song, play another song. We just want to sing more about God's goodness. More about his love for us. Where am I? <laughs> well, David moves on. I'm going to move on to verse 6. He keeps going. 
he starts talking about remembering and meditating on God in the middle of the night. Verse 6 says, For when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. And I wonder how many of you wake up at 3 in the morning um, and you're not really sure why. You just wake up and you're awake. You know, maybe if you're like me, your, your mind goes to the, the stresses of the day ahead or, or maybe the unresolved conflict that you have with people or with your boss or, or with your work from the day behind. And that's what just floods right back into your mind. Or maybe you're just awake because your kid is crying and they need some comfort. Well, whatever it is, I, I'd like to place a challenge on you for this week to try to do. Apply what, what David talks about here in verse 6. And, and when you lay there and, and you're uh, awake and you're not really sure why, and, you, and you, all those stresses start coming back into your mind or all the worries of this life, or you're holding your kid and, and, and just comforting them, spend time in that moment meditating on God, praying to him, meditating on his love for you, thinking about Jesus, putting your mind back to Calvary onto the cross, meditating on his, on his goodness in your life. See, that, that's, what, that's what David continues to do. If you, if you look at verse 7, he does that. He, he looked back on his life and he saw how God had been his help again and again and again and again. And that's a good practice to do once in a while. We can do it right now as we sit here. Just think back for a minute. Think back to the last year. Some of you maybe have had very difficult years. The last year has been very difficult, but, but think about it for a minute. How, how has God been good? How has he been faithful? How have you seen him guide things and, and work things? Think about maybe the, the last 10 years for a minute. How have you seen God work? How have you seen him guide in your life? How has he been faithful? Maybe some of you can do this. How about the last 50 years? How has God been faithful in your life for the last 50 years? I don't know how many of you can do this. How about the last 90 years? How have you seen God be faithful in your life? After the service, we're going to sing this song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and there's a beautiful line there. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. See, see David, he, he knew this. He, he got this. He, he said in the next verse that he's just this little chick. He's just like this little chick that's, that's peeking between the feathers of a mother hen, totally secure, totally safe. And David, he, he takes this thought, he wraps it all up in that last verse, uh, in verse eight. And he says, my soul clings to you and your right hand upholds me. My soul clings to you and your right hand upholds me. And, and here we have this mystery, this beautiful mystery of how we cling to God, but it's, but it's ultimately he's the one that's holding on to us. And I, I, have, a, I have a little girl, and um, sometimes uh, when people come over, she used to get really afraid, and, and she would turn and start crying, and she would run into my arms, and I would scoop her up, and I would, and I would comfort her and assure her everything's going to be okay. But, but she, like, she's really cute, if you've seen her. But she is not very strong. Um, and so if I just went like this, she would just fall right out of my arms. See, it's not her arms clinging onto my neck that is keeping her secure. It's my arms wrapped around her that is keeping her secure. And the truth is that it's God's arms wrapped around us that keep us secure, even as we, like little kids, just cling on to him for dear life. And even if our grip slips a little bit and if we have doubts and if we waver, the truth is he's still holding on to us. And that's so beautiful that he's the one that's holding on to us. Okay, so David, he takes all this and then he finishes off the psalm by applying it to his situation. And if, I don't know about you, but I wish he just stopped the verse eight here, and he didn't keep going, um, because then we get into some of the muddy waters of, of enemies and death and dying, and, uh, and it gets a little bit confusing maybe for us in our context. But I think it's very, very important that we actually keep going, because this is where we get 
to the cross. And this is where we see how it's possible that David was able to put his trust confidently, confidently in God. So we're going to keep going. Verse 9 and verse 10. Read with me verse 9 and 10. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. See, see David, he trusted God completely for the justice of his situation to be served out. And the glaring question is how? Like, how could he be so sure? How, how could he be so sure that everything was going to work out? It looked very, 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 very bleak in this wilderness for him. And I think the answer is because he trusted a promise that God gave him. He trusted a, a promise uh, that God gave him. He knew God's character and he knew God's promises. And there's a beautiful story in verse, uh, sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 7. We're not going to read it, but you should check it out when you go home. Read it at lunchtime or something. 2 Samuel 7, it talks about the promise that God gave uh, to David, a covenant that he made with David where he promised David. He, he promised David that even when David dies, that his steadfast love would never leave him or his family and that his kingdom would be established forever and ever and ever. And this promise, it found an immediate fulfillment in his son Solomon, but the ultimate fulfillment of that covenant, of that promise, is, is firmly fixed in Jesus Christ. And, and David knew that ultimately he was secure, that ultimately God's justice would win out. And that is why David could praise God while he sat in the wilderness. It's because he rested in the steadfast love of God. And the, and the reality is you cannot have the steadfast love of God without his perfect justice. David knew that ultimately God was going to right every wrong in this world, and he knew that ultimately his enemies were going to be punished in this lifetime or in the life to come. And you know, we, we may not have flesh and blood enemies uh, like David here, but, but the enemy of suffering, the enemy of sin, the enemy of death, those are ones that are always around us. And we all know pain in one form or another. The beautiful truth of the gospel is that God made us a promise too. Way back in Genesis 3, right after the fall, he made a promise. He said, I'm going to crush this, this enemy of sin for good. <clears throat> and he said, I'm going to send my son Jesus to do it. And his love and his justice would defeat sin forever. He showed his love to us by sending Jesus and putting him on the cross. See, where, where the love of God for fallen sinners, like or for you and, and, and for me, and, and his justice for our sins was on full display. See, God's, God's love for us is better than life because it was given to us through Jesus giving up his life for us. It's exactly what John says in 1 John 3, 16. He says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. By this you know love. By this you know the love of God, that Jesus saw you in your sin, in your brokenness, in your pain, in your suffering, in your doubts, and he chose to die. So that one day all of this could be undone, and the curse could be taken away, and you would never ever experience another day of sin, of brokenness, of pain ever again. That's the promise. And then he finishes the psalm, verse 11. Read with me, verse 11. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exalt, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. See, when you, when you swear your oath of allegiance to King Jesus, when you say, Jesus, I'm going to be a follower of you, when you put your faith in him, the promise is that you will be exalted by him. And that's the promise for us here, that, that Jesus, who, who loved you and laid down his life for you, is coming back. And when he does, the steadfast love and the justice of God will again be on full display. So to wrap this up, if, you, if you're thirsty this morning, if you are thirsty this morning, come to Jesus. And let your soul drink deeply of his love for you. And look at the cross. See the depths of his love for you. And then go into your week, whatever you're facing, 
as you leave this room, standing firmly on the steadfast love of God, a, a love that is better than life itself. And you know, it's because of all of this that we can say with, with, with smiles on our faces or sometimes with tears in our eyes that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Please pray with me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Psalm 63. We thank you for inspiring David to teach us how to respond to you in whatever situation we're going through. Whatever wilderness we find ourselves in, we pray that you would make us thirsty, Father. Make us thirsty and satisfy us completely in your love. We thank you for your love poured out on us because of Jesus Christ on the cross. Thank you for Jesus, for taking our sin away from us and promising that nothing will ever, ever separate us ever again from your love, no matter what comes our way. Holy Spirit, work this truth deep into our hearts and help us to go from here encouraged, renewed, and comforted by the steadfast love of God. Thank you for your deep love for us. Accept our praises to you from our lips as we lift up our hands and we praise you for your goodness in our life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing of, of God's faithfulness um, by standing. Please stand with me and let's sing from hymn 66. Hymn 66, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
May I uh, lead us in a congregational prayer? Heavenly Father, how beautiful it is to reflect on your incredible and, and beautiful word. And we could start off our service with the reading uh, from your servant Paul, where you call us conquerors, or more than conquerors. And Lord, we can certainly attest, every person here, that uh, there is many a day that we do not feel like conquerors. We feel actually conquered. Uh, conquered by the, the weight of the week, the weight of life, the challenges that sometimes overflow into our lives, uh, live in our heart, uh, the burden and the weight of sin that can sometimes just take us so down. But we're so thankful, Lord, that, that you just don't leave us there. Because as you, as you said, we're more than conquerors through the love of Jesus Christ. And how beautiful that is, and how comforting that is as we 